day and welcome to another session of the Public Intellectual Lecture Series of Far Eastern University. I am Leo from the Interdisciplinary Studies Department and our session for today involves threats to Philippine media and democracy. We have here for today's guests, Melinda Quintos de Jesus, Executive Director of the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility. And we also have Marites Vitung, Editor at Large of Rappler and a self-professed fugitive, apparently. So thank you very much, uh, Melinda and Marites, for accommodating us for today's session. So let's start things off perhaps with the broad, with the broad strokes and uh, situation of Philippine media and press freedom. Perhaps, Marites, you can discuss something about that. Yes, I think I'd like to give a little bit of historical perspective. Since I was a journalist a hundred years ago, <laughs> now I mean in the dying days of martial law. So at the time, the rules were black and white. When a dictator, state censor censorship was uh, reigned. Uh, you could not write critically about the first family, the military, uh, yeah, the president, of course, President Marcos. So very clear. Uh, everything was, you know, who was the enemy? The dictator. Uh, today, more than 30 years later, when uh, democracy returned in 1986, the situation is different in the sense that this is the first time we're experiencing threats that do not come from, a, from um, let's say, a very defined source. The threats, of course, from the president, but he doesn't need to declare martial law to threaten uh, media and the journalists. He, the president, Rodrigo Duterte, int intimidates the media. How? One, he threatens uh, journalists, editors, publishers publicly. Number two, he uses state agencies to go after news organizations. For example, uh, the Bureau of Internal Revenue, uh, which files cases, tax um, deficit cases, against Rappler and Inquirer. He also uses the Securities and Exchange Commission, a regulatory body, to go after Rappler and look at the corporate structure. And then there's also the Solicitor General who also goes after media who are critical of government. So it is not, uh, there are no rules in black and white. Suddenly, you'll, a news organization may just find itself harassed by state agencies. Another way also of um, intimidating the media or pressuring the media is through the use of social media. Uh, this is, there is no uh, maybe concrete proof yet, but these are funded by Duterte supporters or government supporters. And these social media accounts uh, disparage or criticize independent media, spread fake news about independent media. So it's a, it's a mix of threats coming from identified sources and unidentified uh, sources. And like I said, compared to the Marcos years where you were, there was state censorship, those uh, journalists who were seen as activists were sent to jail and then uh, news media was shut down, like ABS, you know, if you recall, but you're too young <laughs> maybe to remember. Thank you. So that's actually a very interesting point, Martas, because you mentioned authoritarianism led to the censorship of media, not even just censorship, but the close, the control of media. But Melinda, what I want to ask regarding that point, no, because you're the executive director for CMFR, or the Center for Media, Free of, uh, Center for media Freedom and Responsibility, no? um, given repression, did media, well, as of the moment, no, especially with the advent of fake news and the uh, spreading of propaganda through online means, no, what is the role? How did, did media play a role in the emergence of these situations? No, na, the, the popularity of social media no, to the point that they're competing no, with, popular, with more established media institutions. No? Did media or the media institutions play a role in that in terms of the practice? Was there something wrong or what, were there things that should be addressed we're in terms of media practice? You're talking about the new media that mm -hmm. lives in cyberspace or mm -hmm. that operates in cyberspace, as well as the traditional media mm -hmm. that now have begun to use the same platforms mm -hmm. as cyberspace. So 
the role of the media is simply the use of these new platforms. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that the mainstream media that use them still provide an editorial process mm -hmm. that vets, that checks the facts, that goes through an uh, accuracy tests, mm -hmm. making sure that there is verification before they come out with it on their online news. The new part of this mm -hmm. media situation is that everyone can be a Mm -hmm. what you call a journalist at this time. Everybody can be a source of news. Uh, if you happen to be in a public event and you have your gadget, your phone, you can actually put it up there in cyberspace and you will be the first, mm -hmm. the one to, who, have, who breaks that news and some of the other established news organizations will even turn to that initial uh, image that you captured and that you posted. So the whole idea then of the role of the media has come completely uh, changed. Mm. Uh, it is no longer as we have thought of before mm. as credential news organizations mm. that go through an established process of determining what news should be out there and how this news is to be interpreted. Now there are no rules, mm. right? And established media or the traditional media are basically tailoring their own ways of mm. making right. of of fashioning the news mm. so that it can fit a little bit more into this great big mm. world of cyber news mm. i mean i think though in a discussion we need to say when we talk of media do we mean media as the platform or do we mean media as an institution mm. if we talk about media as an institution then we must use an older term mm. we must say the press or the journalistic press. media those who have taken it upon themselves to determine what the agenda is in terms of what citizens need to be informed about because that is where the constitutional protection comes from Okay, and last I heard, we still <laughs> are a constitutional mm. liberal democracy. Mm. Although, if you ask me, I think <laughs> all bets are off. If we have done what we have done and allowed to have done, uh, the jailing of a mm. sitting senator, the oustering of a head of mm. an independent co-equal branch of mm. government, with hardly a peep from anyone, mm. I don't think we can call ourselves a working democracy anymore. We still have an election, but an election I think that we should actually ask ourselves where or what were the choices or was there the liberty to make those choices. So you can have elections and still not be a democracy. But that also raises a very interesting point because you mentioned you have the press and then you have the people in social media presenting or providing content isn't there an arg is, couldn't the argument be made that before media was controlled or information was controlled by institutions like established dailies um, networks who provided news isn't it an uh, a proof that there is a vibrant democracy where you now have people More. More people, More people that you don't have to. Of course, I'm I'm quite sure. I'm not sure if that's always the case. But you know, there's a tendency for media institute for the press to have gatekeepers, right, where they can decide this is the story you publish because we only have a limited amount of space. Now everyone can has do a voice, can do it. Right. Huh? What so do you think about it? Yeah, I, I I think it was all intended to be good, mm -hmm. right? And those who have engaged in them have basically said, well, I can be part of this great, huge conversation. And democracy does not work unless you have mm. conversation. Mm. Uh, the whole system mm. relies on the equality of the terms of that conversation that anybody can get in, that you can actually be part of that discourse, that you can be part of that exchange. Unfortunately, in this game, mm. I think governments have over, uh, overrun, right? Mm. All the other communities mm. they have captured, they have. Mm. And it is not only in the Philippines, it is also in other developed democracies, as mm. well as in the growing democracies in, in the different places in the world. You now have governments that feel that they can hold to control the platforms, the messaging, the ideas, 
and use propaganda in a way that has never before been uh, energized by the kind of speed and reach that the internet has given them. So we are in deep trouble, if to use a polite yeah. word, uh, and, and we need to think about this. Yeah. The, the other effect is that when you had a traditional media, you had people listening to certain sources of mm -hmm. news, and therefore it, is, it was easier to develop uh, a shared framework of mm -hmm. understanding. Um, people knew, even if you disagreed, mm -hmm. you could understand why your disagreement in this cacophony mm. of sounds and messages and political issues, there's very little time to mm. actually sit down and basically say, why are we disagreeing? Mm. And where is the common ground? Mm. Unless there is an established common ground, mm. unless we say we all want to, to live according to arrangements that are based on values, equality, freedom, mm. human rights that is enjoyed by all citizens, then we can have a clever dictator or a clever authoritarian strongman ruler basically say, what I want is what is going to be followed and what is going to be good. And everyone else can be silenced by the sounds mm. of this huge exchange that we call this marvelous democratic mm. instrument mm that the internet has given us. That's a good point because you're now talking about social media discourse. Is it really an avenue? Or is it really a marketplace of ideas where we can find common grounds? Or is it just an echo chamber? That's no? right. Or That's several a, echo chambers mm. or what you call silos or ghettos mm. of ideas. And you don't want to cross beyond that because mm. it becomes a threatening and intimidating place to be mm. in an exchange where everyone is against you mm. and you're the only voice in the wilderness. Which is my point then, no? which I want to ask then Kay Marites. No? Because you were talking about, of course, Rappler is, has it's, it is, it's quite interesting no, to see a media institution be part of the news itself no, rather than delivering the news. No? You're now, you were put in the front pages of various news, uh, news features no, discussing how the government is attacking Rappler, trying to silence Rappler. No? And you live in a medium or you're operating in the medium where most of their influence is actually felt, no, which is online, cyberspace. No? Given that the cyber that cyberspace is supposed to be a tool for democratization, no? how does Rappler, for example, how can online um, news agencies still position themselves, no, as, of, or how do you see still your roles, no, as the press, no, as the arbiters, no, as the defenders of press freedom or freedom of expression, no? given that this space that you're trying to occupy, no it is surrounded and more or less dominated by people who are also expressing you know, certain opinions that might not be valid or propaganda. Yeah. I think uh, we have to go back to the basics. Technology has changed, maybe the ground has shifted under our, beneath our feet, but the basics are uh, you have to report news that is factual, mm. that is accurate, that is honest, uh, that's quite important these days because of the avalanche of fake news. That's why an additional role for media organizations like Rappler, uh, there's also Vera Files, there's also GMA Channel 7 online, is to do fact checking. And that has become uh, an important concern that uh, media organizations themselves should fact check other <coughs> so-called fake news, which is spreading on social media. Um, but first, before we can do that, we ourselves have to be uh, faithful to our profession. We have to be credible, otherwise nobody will listen to us, will read us. And that means really hard work, uh, a lot of research, and a lot of connecting to the audience. And if you notice, uh, um, Rappler and Vera Files are partners, are third-party partners of Facebook in the Philippines that do fact-checking. You know, I don't envy their work. I've talked to our young millennial reporters and researchers who do fact-checking. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of fake news. And this is not, 
these are not accidental bits of information planted, but these are deliberate uh, means, yes, to deceive, to mislead. So that's why it's very important to uh, educate also and to inform the listeners, readers about you know what is really what stands out as news, what is true and and factual, and that's I think where the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility comes in. They've been doing a lot of media literacy, uh, and other groups have joined in as well. So there's additional work now for news organizations. It's not just reporting. You also have to f fact check. And now, aside from that, is you have to engage the readers in various forms. That's a, a great challenge. You know, how to tell the story so that you can connect to readers. Because there's so much competition, so much stimuli. So it's, it's, it's a very, very big challenge. Thank you, Mertz. You wanted to add something? Yes. Um, first of all, I think we need to point out that journalism in itself is a process that requires fact-checking, verification, so that the stories every that come out, yes, should involve every story that comes out should be as accurate as possible in terms of how it has been uh, produced in the editorial process. The fact-checking now that, that needs to be done shouldn't just come from the news organizations. I think it should be all the stakeholders in society. I think the academic experts, etc., should be willing to say, well, that's not exactly accurate, what the president said, and call the media and say, I can give you an interview. Come over to the office and we'll talk about this and I'll give you a background story on what actually is the contextual accuracy of it because it isn't only factual accuracy but also the real narrative of how certain things developed. Um, the limitations of journalism now have have come out so dramatically. The way we train ourselves to be journalists ought to be improved on, it ought to grow. At the same time, I think it isn't only the task of the journalists. It should be the task of everyone that looks to what we have become as a nation to review what are our responsibilities here. And I call on the academic community again and again that they too be ready to engage in the public sphere, in the public discourse. You are supposed to be the sources of education of the young, not just the young. But we need to marry, we need to join the force of media spreading what truths, what facts, what narratives that the nation needs to hold itself to. Thank you. And that's also where I want to lead to next, no? because you were talking about truth, fact checking. Present and there's a challenge involved because it's not just a simple task to express the truth, but also and to be held accountable. Because unlike you know, let's be honest, no, some people, some social media personalities, content makers, they're not liable. No, they don't have repercussions if they misrepresent information. Unlike journalists, no. um, but that's also it's not just the that aspect, no, the legal harassment, but also the how. Um, how the state or even how some actors, no, political actors, have responded to the attempts of the press to tell the truth. No? On one hand, you have Rappler, which, was, which, uh, which the government utilized several legal institutional processes to harass. But what about perhaps the provinces where I'm not sure what the total number of uh, how, or how many journalists have already been um, killed in the provinces, but isn't that a problem? We're in, of course, in Manila, you could get broadcast. You could, it could be a big issue if you're, if you're harassed. But in the provinces, how does media repression happen? And how does it impact, especially us in the centers? It is definitely a dangerous profession to be in the community press. One, you are dealing with people who know one another and therefore um, tempers the hostilities can become much more volatile because you are face to face with a community that you are covering. You, a city hall, everybody knows who you are and the threats are real. It, this, but this is not new 
to the situation. We have always been one of the countries already labeled as the most dangerous assignment by the Committee to Protect Journalists. And that is because we have over a, about over now it's a number of publications exist not to be uh, not to s give us the news True. but to cater to the powers that be so yeah. i will not name them or maybe i should name them maybe we should <laughs> maybe we should i think it, this maybe is we should it <laughs> is a divided it is <laughs> exactly. a divided yeah. institution. that's uh, i was going into that that how come we are not united beyond the telling of the right. story uh, we are not united against the threats against the media we are a divided media and divided press because there are news organizations that exist not to tell the story not to tell facts but to, to fabricate be, even to fabricate or to be used by the powers that be to be in the good graces of, of whoever is in power or maybe even that these news enterprises had been established anyway mm -hmm. so that it can serve as political instruments of those who want to retain power in one way or another whether mm -hmm. they are in actual power now or not mm -hmm. they are there to serve some kind of political agenda and it would be good for the rest of the people to basically know that that is the purpose of their mm -hmm. existence i shall say it the manila times is one of them <laughs> <laughs> well they uh, clearly you don't have to say it. i mean if you know the story of the matrix and who broke it yes. right okay. Where Malacanian basically said, we have the same story. Naunahan lang kami ng Manila Times. O naunahan pa sila. Yun na nga. So, it, 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 to, my, to my mind, it it's just become so clear that so many of them are either going to sit on the fence and basically not get involved. And why they are there, I do not know. Huh? But those who are actively being used as vehicles of false news or fake news. You mentioned a very important point. You said news enterprise, no? so which leads me to ask: Since you're uh, you're running, you're part of an, an organization, no? that's does it really affect the fact that news is not? How do we view media, the news in, uh, press institutions today? Are they enterprises? Are they businesses? Or are or should they be public trusts? No? Because that's what we were, we were talking about, Melinda and I were talking about it earlier. How should media be, sh how should the press position itself? Should it be in private hands or in public hands? Should it be treated as a, an enterprise, as a business, or as something that contributes to the public welfare? Well, I think both. It should be a public trust and it should make money to survive. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there will be no uh, long term future for news organizations. And staying independent staying independent in these days no, of media being now owned by let's say one or two entities uh, Philippine Star, Business World, TV5 that's owned by one group etc uh, etc et no? so staying independent nowadays or even before in, in the past years requires one to be able to raise funds for one's existence but at the same time keeping uh, to your, be faithful to your duty as journalists. So we cannot separate being a public trust and being an enterprise, but not to be captured by two big advertisers, maybe the telcos or just specific number of advertisers. Uh, there should be independence uh, in reporting, even if you are reporting on uh, one of your advertisers. You just have to get the side of the save of smart let's say let's say or globe if you're writing about them but we cannot really separate the two very good right, melinda um that's the problem because you were talking about if the news broke out in one daily i don't want to be second but you know in the past people did not mind doing follow-up stories going on a separate angle with a story that was broken by or uh, that broke out in another newspaper the reference was in a story that was published in and, and then they will not name the newspaper <laughs> if if you watch what has been going on in the US the Washington Post mm -hmm. and the New York Times have been on a real competitive run for the coverage of the Trump administration and they will do better than the other one 
and in that sense have come out with some really excellent political reporting. We are not ready to do that. We're not in that game, I think, at this point, except for a few, and no one else wants to match that. No one else wants to match it. In fact, we, in our monitoring, CMFR does monitoring of the newspapers and the television news programs. We were basically looking at how many stories are simply not reported once it is done by one or the other. We have also noticed that so much more of the facts are coming out of the columnists, the opinion pieces that have made, probably have better sources, are probably braver in terms of like putting out what, what they have pieced together as uh, their interpretation of what is actually happening. Editorials are now outstripping some of the news stories in the same newspaper. We think the editorials of Philippine Daily Inquirer have provided many more facts than what you can find in some of the news accounts about the issues on the same issues. Why is that? that to my mind, I think there has not been a fuller development of the skills, of the process, of what it is about, even the determination of what news matters mm -hmm. at this time. We are always following the government to set that news agenda. Uh, the president only has to have another outrageous remark, and we're all following that instead of sticking to some of the stories that have not yet been clarified. It has not yet grown into the fourth estate. I think I'd like to add a few words on Duterte's style uh, in dealing with the media. No? I've watched a few of these press conferences. He doesn't hold regular press conferences. He likes to dominate. He doesn't like questions, doesn't like you to disagree with him. So this has also intimidated reporters. Because when I, I watched some of them and I said, why is there no follow-up mm. question? And he doesn't want his uh, minder, the moderator rather, doesn't accept follow-up questions if they know that you are quite critical. That's why this led yeah, to the banning of, uh -huh. of uh, uh, reporters, not just one, but mm. all, all, yeah, all Rappler reporters who cover him are not allowed to cover him. <laughs> so it's also the kind of uh, setup that the president does with the media. And if you come unprepared, then the reporters uh, are given answers that they accept. Uh, they don't have uh, time maybe to rebut, or they didn't come unprepared, unprepared rather. And there again, I, I say, why then doesn't the news organization basically not rely only on one correspondent covering that particular story? He talks about many issues. He talks about a story that belongs to many different departments. An editor then should say, Hui, the president said this. It, I just got it from our Malacanian correspondent. Then you all run around all those different departments and get your angle of the story so that we can piece it together and make it an even bigger story, not just what the president said, which if you look at so many of the news accounts are virtually he said, she said. Very few of the news organizations force the reporters to basically get out of the mode of quoting the statements of a public interview or a conference. You, you raised a very, I don't know how to describe, you mentioned that the press in the Philippines has not grown into the fourth estate. No? That's what basically what you're saying. But I would like to pursue something at uh, 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 a certain point you mentioned. Because you said people seem to read editorials, columnists more, or columns, no? rather than the actual news. No? And so far, now what we're seeing now is there seems to be this question of objectivity. It's as if people want, if we're following that same trend, and also how, why certain people are popular in social media, not the press, not social media, it's because they're not objective. No? It's because they present an opinion, and also they, prevent, they present arguments 
that push forward their opinion. So, I, I'll probably raise it to Marites first. So, how does that work? No, it's as if, are we, is there really such a thing now as objectivity in the press? Or is it, or if, you, if you'd like to deter, to clarify, it, is, it every, is everything about propaganda? How is, med, how is the press working on, the, on this type of contradiction nowadays? No, first of all, I, I don't think, I don't believe in objectivity in media. Mm. It's just fairness. Because the choice of information you put in an 500-word news mm. already determines, mm. na, it's not a bias, but mm. you have to choose what to you is the most important. So it's just to be fair that you get uh, uh, the other side or the third side of a story. So that's so we don't usually say we're objective. We're just, we want to be fair and accurate. And there are uh, media personalities. I don't know how to categorize the tool for brothers, for example. <laughs> They're the examples of journalists who are celebrities and who provoke rather than enlighten and who want to... Uh, cater to the powerful also. Uh, so, may, I don't know if, he, because he's the influential journalist on social media that I, I, I hear of, and I don't uh, follow him, although you know, he makes the news. So, uh, that's not my kind of journalist, and that's not our, the kind of journalist that we would like students to uh, model, f to, to follow, uh, because they, are more after being celebrities rather than real journalists. I think broadcasters should be trained as journalists first before they are taught the skills of miking and having this radionic voice and whatever, right? And engaging their audience out there. If we call them journalists, whatever platform they're on, then they have to do journalism, which is delivering, determining what the news that matters, the news that make a difference, the information that will help you become better citizens so that you can participate in the public sphere. To get back to the issue of objectivity, I mean, this objectivity thing, I think, has been taught as a theory in the schools, in journalism schools, without much discussion about what its impact ought to be when you're actually writing the story. The story is that objectivity, the only meaning that it has is that it has to be factual. Once you get those facts and you get them verified, then you're basically sailing on the issue of objectivity. What has happened is it's become a cloak to protect myself from further finding out any more than just the quote that I got from so-and-so. So I can just say, well, nobody can question my objectivity. That's what he said. My tape says so. Everyone heard it. What does it mean? What did, where did it come from? Why didn't you ask more questions? Because you know that it runs against the face of other facts that you should have known about if you're reporting on that particular issue. I'd like to get both of your thoughts about this. Because you were talking about, um, Melinda, we're talking about what should be done. What is objectivity? You mentioned it also, Marites. This is what should be done. There are certain standards that should be met. No? That's why it's not just about having a bombastic voice. No? It's about being able to investigate and, pres and truly flesh out what needs to be said. No? My question is, how do, you feel, how do you both feel about media professionalization? And when I mean by professionalization, it means you should have, similar to doctors, to nurses, that you should have a an exam that legitimizes that you're a journalist? And how do you feel about media regulation in the sense that there should be, if there is, if you did not, if you're a journalist and you did not provide the truth, you should be penalized for it. What do you think about that? Let's start with you, Marites. Well, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I, I'm definitely against licensing of mm -hmm. journalists. Uh, because we're uh, not dentists and we don't <laughs> pull teeth, you know, <laughs> we give information. However, the the um, the demand is for news organizations, for editors, for publishers to hire and screen uh, 
competent journalists and if they're just starting to train them nurture them with the right values of honesty you know fairness truth you know all this and, and ethical practice of journalism mm. so that really it begins when you enter the world of journalism mm. but even before that when you're in school you study ethics you learn how to think you know you learn what is your world view and then when you want to become a journalist and you want you are hired by a company a news organization that's when the training begins and the values uh, of uh, of that company you know are you imbibe this so i don't believe in licensing and we are in a self-regulatory environment and i think we this self-regulatory environment needs to be strengthened because there are broadcasters journalists who are um, who, are, who have not been penalized unscrupulous yes who <laughs> for their uh, violations of ethical practices you know this thing about corruption let's admit it there is corruption in the media but at least now we get to talk about it we get to expose it unlike before 100 years ago when it was taboo we couldn't speak about journalism journalists accepting money or bribes now it's being talked about we sort of know who are doing it and some newspapers already have sanctioned or fired uh, this um, unworthy journalist so having said that we need to have a better maybe recruitment process for journalists and then training and then for news organizations to be very strict in uh, implementing ethical standards you know if the editor hears even just a uh, uh, a bit of rumor about a reporter I think that editor should already start checking you know I think the, the fear here is they will violate labor laws and <laughs> and the unions and all that so uh, there's a lot of factors but uh, the solution is not to license us mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you how about you no licensing definitely is out of the picture if we go according to our constitution because the press freedom falls under the freedom of expression and nobody needs to have a license to speak out freedom of expression is the mother of all other rights mm -hmm. that allows us to talk about other rights right so we don't want a government to put out some kind of a test mm -hmm. to prove that then you are now authorized to speak or mm -hmm. to become the source of news Definitely self-regulation and self-regulation that includes a whole lot of other mm -hmm. things. A news council that will take test cases and basically say, well, you need to go through these one, two, three, four steps to discipline, mm -hmm. okay? Whatever it is, mm -hmm. it may be punishment, mm -hmm. it may not be punishment, but discipline those who are offending or those who have aggrieved um, the public or anyone or an individual or whatever it includes journalism reviews which the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility mm -hmm. has undertaken against all odds if you will remember when we first started doing moni media monitoring we were became the pariah in the news institution we brought out the story of corruption first by journalists basically saying yes there is corruption in the media and all of a sudden everybody hated cmfr on what we were about but it is now over 30 years or 30 years that we have existed and we have also recognized good works so people can say that we are objective in that <laughs> sense <laughs> so we i i believe that mm. self-regulation must also involve the public mm. the public must also be skilled enough good enough brave enough to give feedback mm. when it knows that a story has been angled in a way to put a false spin to what actually happened and Filipinos are just not ready to do that mm -hmm. as quickly, perhaps, as other citizens in other countries. For one thing, I think the letters to the editor, these are mm -hmm. the old traditional old media, right? The ago, old no? traditional letters media. Letters. The letters to the editor have sunk now into a little <laughs> one column, two columns. It used to be a big thing. And it used to be read a lot. Editors no. used to say, I like to sample all the letters that we get because it gives you, it it allows you to have a pulse 
on the public and what it's really thinking. But all of this have gone completely out of whack. Why? Because we have social media where anybody can talk anyway, right? So what do we do? What do we do to separate us from just the noise, from just anyone who feels brilliant today and therefore I am going to give you what? 5,000, 1,000? No, no, it's limitless, right? They call them influencers, I think. No. So what do we do about this? We need education. In the end, that is going to be the basis of the future of the press and the future of democracy. Thank you. And now you're talking about the future. No? The future. Given this shift, no, this shift from traditional means of delivering information, we're now moving into a world where everyone can speak. How does this, you know, for example, in the, of course you're talking about people who can write. Of course you'll start with the universities. You're, you're, you're ta um, both of you were talking about self-regulation, but that comes with a responsibility, the responsibility that you know what you're doing. No? Um, I'm thinking about, because I was talking about it to you earlier, during the martial law era, no, when media was censored, it was held th by the throat, no, the, the, the media institutions that popped up or suddenly took, uh, went at the forefront were campus publications, no, campus, the campus press. No. I was thinking, what about now? No, given that media, of course, is encountering harassment, repression, no, what do you think will be the role of the campus press in this new world where everyone can talk? Where how, where, what is the role that will be played by the youth and later on by the campus press in terms of self-regulation, in terms of improving the, the media institutions, the press institutions? Perhaps I'll start with you, Melanie. First of all, let me t may I ask, is there still a campus press? The campus press, in the US, for example, in the 60s was a daily newspaper. Every single day you could pick it up free. And there were students who were less students, they were <laughs> campus journalists. And some of them probably had to take two extra years in order to finish their degrees. We don't have that. We have an institution that is kind of like a watered down newsletter, I think. Unless you have something going on digitally that we don't know about. And I don't know why it shouldn't go digital, because everybody is digital anyway. So the role of the campus press, I think, is not just to grow future journalists. Sometimes it does not. Sometimes it grows future politicians, no. right? But I think it grows a conversation. It grows an exchange, a venue. It establishes a venue where you and I can have a conversation. Whether that happens on whatever platform, I think, is less important. What is more important is that there is. If then we are talking about the campus press or the point of the campus press, tell me how much conversation is going on when everybody pulls out a gadget and is buried in the echo chamber that he or she has chosen for the day. What is the role of the campus press? I don't think that's an answer that we can provide. <laughs> I think it's an answer that you must provide us no and give us uh, a sense of what is going on now in the campuses. Mm. Because it's no longer the world in which Marites and I, <laughs> the, and we are a, a, a bit of a world mm. apart, right? Um, <coughs> and what we were as students then is a completely different environment than what it is now. The only thing that holds is there are still teachers, there are still classrooms, and students still have to pass mm. with good grades. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> How about you, Marita? No, well, I think uh, campus journalists, well, <laughs> I think campus journalists, Melinda mentioned, uh, campus journalism is a training ground no, for future journalists. What is important, I think, is that they learn to question authority. Mm. Because, you know, it's, as students, you're easily intimidated by teachers, principal, or deans. Mm. So for me, it is a time to test also how a student journalist can 
question or deal with authority mm -hmm. because that will uh, shape this person in the future. No? Not just as a future journalist, but as someone who will work in maybe government or in, in the private sector. It is challenging authority, it is questioning authority, at the same time being able to uh, also get the knowledge and information from these authorities who at the s whom at the same time you respect, but at the same time you also uh, question and challenge. Thank you. So as a final question, I'd like to ask both of you, why should the youth care you know, with the present situation of press freedom? We were talking about earlier how, how the press is being oppressed, repressed, no? but at the end of the day, you know, and you were talking about the conditions of the campus press and how students process and obtain information, no? but at the end of the day, you know, why should the youth really concern itself you know, about these issues of press freedom? What will happen or what do you think will happen eventually if society lives in a world where the press is silent or there is no such thing as press freedom? Perhaps I'll start with you, Marites. Yeah, why should the youth care? <laughs> because otherwise there's nothing to read when they <laughs> <laughs> scroll their mobile phones. I mean, uh, information is vital in a democracy. How do, the, how do our young people make decisions? How do they decide whom to vote for? How do they decide what stands, positions to take on issues like uh, China's encroachment in the features uh, belonging to the Philippines' exclusive economic zones? No? If there were no free press, if there were no free flow of information, then how would we know? How would they know about what's happening you know, outside? our shores, within the country, how would they even be able to think um, and question things, issues? So I think if, there, if we didn't have a free press in the Philippines, then can you, it's like going back to uh, martial law. Of course, today the difference is there is the internet, but what if the Philippines draws, uh, builds a firewall? What if we aspire to be like Duterte's great friend China, you know? Uh, so it, uh, it's very difficult to imagine a world wherein uh, there is no free flow of information. So I think just that idea should instill fear <laughs> in the young people that suddenly they, they will not have access you know, to information um, no matter with the technology, if what is being fed is controlled by government. Mm -hmm. How about you? It's true. I mean, I think the um, only thing that would make them really care would be the threat to their access to whatever it is that they're getting in their gadgets. Mm -hmm. I don't think everybody uses the mobile to access. In the provinces, for example. To access news that matters, they're there to connect with somebody from somewhere, or they are there. They open up to to be informed or to be with the latest fashion, or K-pop or whatever you have, right? Or following an athlete or following whoever cele celebrity. Tell them that if it isn't a democracy, you won't have that. Everyone will have a uniform flowing thing from their particular social media. What else or how else will they care? I think if there was some disaster or catastrophe and there is nothing that dramatizes the need for information, where is my father or if someone else that he cares about is not within sight, you need to find out, and who can find out for you are these organizations that have been trained and, s and are established to put together communities that are in the middle of catastrophe and calamity. I do not wish that to be the lesson with which to demonstrate that you do need to be connected in ways that are more meaningful than what just pleases you or what makes life more fun in the Philippines. The whole idea of 
being part of a society and being part of a community, as they grow older, they need to be prepared for the fact that life is hard and you don't know how to prepare yourselves for what will happen. Getting connected to information that matters and to the news that will affect you as an individual in this community, this is the point of having a press and having a democracy. Thank you very much, Melinda. And thank you very much, Marites, for accommodating us for today. So just to sum things up, no, we have to ask this question. No? In this digital age where everyone can be heard and everyone has a voice, does the press still have space in our society, in a world driven by consumption, in a world driven by half-truths or personal truths, driven by fake news? Is there really such a thing as a search for the truth? And how does media play a role in that part, in that function, especially in the establishment of social justice and order?